All right, y'all. So I've referenced the start of this series and a lot of my other previous series. So those of you who are subscribed to the channel and who have watched those videos should already know or at least have an idea of who and what this series will be about. But for those of you who don't know, um, I'll explain. I'll explain real quick what this series is going to be about. So this series is going to be the beginning of the transition into a time period that I find to be the most overall um, important time period of so-called black people of the Western Hemisphere's history to understand and be able to properly contextualize what exactly went on during this time period and what preceded afterwards. Um, this era in our history that I'm referring to is what's known conventionally as the quote-unquote medieval time period or the quote-unquote dark ages. And this era in history came literally at the exact same time that the great and powerful Roman Empire fell, or at least seemingly so. But what a lot of people don't really know or understand, and a lot of it has to do with the diminishing of the contribution of this civilization over the years, starting at around the time of the Renaissance era. But what a lot of people don't know is that the Roman Empire did not fall in 476 AD, which is the conventional time period that people give for the Roman Empire's collapse and for the start of the medieval age. But in fact, it actually lasted for almost a thousand years more after the alleged year of its fall. Um, and unfortunately, this is not acknowledged because, once again, there has been this concerted attempt to diminish the contribution of the latter portion of the Roman Empire and even make it a completely separate entity from the quote-unquote conventional Roman Empire by calling it the quote-unquote Byzantine Empire, which is a term that um, was not used at all whatsoever by the people who lived within this empire or within this kingdom. Um, only later on was it called the quote-unquote Byzantine Empire by scholars during the Enlightenment time period and even as early as the mid-1500s where the term quote-unquote Byzantine was first used to refer to the latter Roman Empire by the German historian um, Hieronymus Wolff. Um, these are some of the people who initialized the attempt to try and separate the Byzantine Empire from the Roman Empire to try and create this narrative that the Byzantine Empire wasn't as illustrious or as influential as the quote-unquote real Roman Empire was. And in some ways it wasn't, but for the most part the Byzantine Empire was in a lot of ways just as if not more influential than the Roman Empire that was established under Julius Octavius Augustus Caesar in 27 BC. But the main reason for the, for the cover-up regarding this empire in my opinion opinion is because it was predominantly ruled over by so-called black people for most of its existence from its first ever emperor who we'll talk about in a second constantine the great to its last emperor also named constantine constantine the 11th who ultimately lost the empire to the upstart incumbent so-called caucasian ottoman turks who were starting to become a more dominant presence within europe and um, this was a this was around the time that the so-called caucasian was starting to become more dominant in europe overall and, but that will be another story for another day. But just getting back to the Byzantine Empire, once again, yes, it was ruled over by so-called blacks, regardless of what people who may know about this empire might think or believe. Yes, the Byzantine Empire, really um, just the Roman Empire, was indeed ruled over by so-called blacks. But you know what? I can show you guys better than I can tell you that this was indeed the case. So let's first talk about the very beginning of this empire's existence, starting with its originator and forefather, who I already mentioned was Constantine the Great. So let's start off by talking about him. So Constantine the Great was, as I already stated, the originator and progenitor of the Byzantine Empire. And something that people have to understand about Constantine is that for the most part, he was not what you would call a righteous man, despite what gets propagated about him and his alleged allegiance to the Christian religion. Um, please understand that Constantine is one of the main reasons why there is so much confusion over the origins of so-called Christianity and why a lot of people think that the belief in the scriptures and in God the Father and his son Jesus, or as he was originally known as Yeshua, is no different from other so-called pagan religious systems and is basically just an offshoot of paganism itself. Um, he and other so-called Christian bishops during his time who met at a Christian council that, that has gone down in history to be known as the Council of Nicaea basically shaped the practices that are rooted in paganism and are still at work today in the so-called Christian church no matter the denomination. Um, so when you go to church on quote-unquote Sunday, please understand that that is not a biblical day. Sunday is never mentioned in the Bible as the day of observation for the Most High and His Son. 
Um, Sunday was first declared as the day of observation by Constantine himself in 321 AD, and it was officially declared as the day of observation by Constantine and, his, and the Christian bishops at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. And they ratified the real day of observation that is still supposed to be practiced to this day in the Sabbath day, okay? So when you hear so-called Christians claim that it, that it is okay to worship the Most High and Christ on so-called Sunday, and that it doesn't matter what day we celebrate Christ, Please understand that they're not speaking from a place of knowledge and understanding about what it is that they're doing. Because in reality, so-called Sunday was a day that was originally dedicated to the sun god or one of the sun gods that Constantine worshipped who was known as Mithras. Um, that is why he ultimately ratified the Sabbath and replaced it with Sunday. So again, you guys who may identify as Christians who are watching this video, please understand that when you go to church on Sunday, that day is not in worship of the Most High or Christ. It is a day dedicated to, dedicated to the sun god Mithras, who um, that is who you are actually worshiping on that day. Okay, whether you like it, understand it, acknowledge it or not, that is what you're doing on that day. And even other days like so that's like so called Christmas. Again, that has nothing to do with Christ. And again, it goes back to the worship of another sun god entity that Constantine worshipped, who was known as quote unquote Sol Invictus. And this quote-unquote God will be featured on the back of a lot of the coins he issued during his time period as Emperor of Rome. But the pagan origins of the so-called Christian church will be a topic that I will cover on my biblical channel in much greater depth later on down the line. So make sure you guys go subscribe to that when you can. But anyways, I just wanted to say all that, I just wanted to say all that to state that Constantine is a prime example of a figure in so-called black people's history who just because he was black, we tend to think that he automatically deserves praise and adulation because he was a black man that ruled over and established a prominent empire in history. And the reason for this um, thought process, in my opinion, that I've seen from other channels on YouTube is because our people haven't been taught much about our real history. When we discover things like Constantine and other prominent people in history um, being so-called black, we tend to over glorify them as venerable figures because we get so excited about us actually taking part in an area in history where we would have never thought we could have we, what we never thought we could have um, been a part of. But we can't marvel too much at the spectacle of figures like Constantine being so-called black, even though it is rather amazing to find out. But now let's go about proving this to be true um, for those of you who may not know this already or who may be doubting it. So this first image is what is known as an icon, which um, was basically just a portrait of a notable or sacred figure that were uh, or that was essential to the Eastern Orthodox Church and just the so-called Christian religion in general. Um, a lot of these icons were created by the Byzantine and Russian Orthodox churches and we will definitely take a look at the Russian Orthodox Church icons because they tell a lot about what the rulers of Russia looked like during the medieval time period all the way down to the Russian czars of the mid to late 15 to the of the mid to late 1500s starting with Ivan the Terrible on down but anyway of course for this video we'll be focusing on mainly the Byzantine icons and in this icon right here which is indeed an icon that depicts Constantine the Great and his mother, the legendary Christian Saint Helen or Saint Helena. Um, we can clearly see that these are that these people are depicted as being so-called black people. I mean, this is clear as day. They both have dark brown skin. Constantine looks to have an Afro hair texture as well. And before I go further, I just wanted to, I just want to address one of the main narrative that one of the main narratives that gets propagated about these icons and and that's that the skin color of a lot of these figures that are depicted on these icons only are dark colored because of the because of how old the portrait is. So over time it got darker or the skin color of the individual became brown because of this reason. And um, this this is just not the case because if this was indeed true, then why is it only the skin color that changes colors and becomes a dark brown color and not everything in the image that surrounds the figures and the icon? And when you just look at Constantine and Helena on this icon, there's not even any semblance of white paint on their faces at all whatsoever. Like you'd think that if these two images of Constantine and Helena were truly just darkened over the course of time because of how old the icon is, um, that some of the white paint that was originally used supposedly would still be there to a degree. But this straight up just shows two, two um, dark brown skinned people, right? Two so-called black people. And the last thing I wanted to mention that I think is important to know or keep in mind is the fact that a lot of people may see this video and say that these icons aren't necessarily the best representation of what Constantine and Helena looked like since they were made way after both of them had lived. But 
What needs to be understood is that the original depictions that were made of these figures, like Constantine and other notable figures of the Byzantine time period, depict these figures how they would have actually looked. Unlike the more redone, Im redone images of Constantine and Hel Helena, like this one right here, that depicts them as two so-called Caucasian-looking people. Now you can tell the difference um, that this one is redone because it looks far more modern than the one that I showed before. Look at this one and now just take a quick look at the one that I originally displayed. You see how the colors are a bit more faded and diminished in this icon versus the colors in this, in this one right here that look like they had just been painted recently. And you can clearly see in this more modern one that they tried to retain the brownish skin color a little bit, but they still lighten the image and change the original colors from the more archaic image. And this is something that is done quite often to, to art from the ancient time period um, to antiquity to the medieval time period, etc., where they will lighten the image of a picture that is displayed on something like an icon or a fresco painting or even a or even an, a medieval a medieval illuminated manuscript, and they take advantage of the fact that the vast majority of the original images from these from these time periods that were made um, are no longer during are no longer around due to them either being destroyed or discarded. Um, it's very similar to what I showed in my last video series and how Egyptologists and geneticists would concoct these fake false images of notable ancient Egyptian pharaohs like Ramses II or Akhenaten or most famously King Tutankhamun by creating fake DNA facial reconstructions and even and even um, fake or redone busts and statues to try and propagate that, that the ancient Egyptians were this Caucasoid race of people. And this is something that I will talk about um, in much further depth in the series that I'm going to do right, at, right after this one before I go really in depth into the medieval time period. But yeah, this right here is very commonplace for a lot of these historical images. But now let's move on and take a look at another image of Constantine the Great. So now this is an icon that is kept at a church that was actually dedicated to both Constantine and Helena within the city of Jerusalem and within the walls of another church known as the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. And they had this church dedicated to them because of their alleged contributions to so-called Christianity. Um, um, allegedly, Helena, or as she's known in the Eastern Orthodox Christian circles as St. Helen, um, took a pilgrimage to the city of Jerusalem where she found the cross that Christ was crucified on and after this she felt inspired to erect churches all throughout Jerusalem most, nam most namely at the site of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection and also at Bethlehem in the area where Christ was born and then in many other areas as well like the Mount of Olives and um, other areas in Jerusalem and Cyprus etc etc so she did a lot for the so-called Christian faith in regards to building churches and then Constantine was basically the one who legalized Christianity within the Roman Empire after Christians had been persecuted by past Roman emperors like his teacher and predecessor Maximian and then his one-time ally um, Licentius but like I stated earlier Constantine was not really a believer in the scriptures and in my personal opinion, he only quote unquote converted to Christianity as an attempt to try and galvanize his army to fight against the army of another Roman emperor who he had to defeat in order to gain control over the entire western portion of the Roman Empire who was named Maxentius. But I'll talk more about this as I move forward in, the, in this video. Um, but just getting back to this icon right here of Constantine and Helena, as we can see once again, they are depicted as two people of color with dark brown skin. Um, obviously, they are, they are being portrayed as two so-called black people. And this is the way that um, they chose to depict these two in their own church that was dedicated to them. So an, an image like this had to have been made with the intent to try and depict them properly and, and as accurately as possible. So again, this had, this had to have been the actual appearance of Constantine and his mother Helena. But when you, research icons of, when you research icons of these two, once again, you'll get results that look like this, where they are depicted in, in remodeled, redone icons like two so-called Caucasians. But these two original icons that I've displayed clearly show them as two so-called black people. So now let's take a look at a couple more images of Constantine, of Constantine and his mother Helen. So now this is Constantine the Great and St. Helena on an icon from Greece that was made for them around the 18th century. And once again, we can clearly see that these two are so-called black people. And this, is one, and this one is more flagrant about displaying them with um, so-called black features when you look at the image. You can clearly see that, they're both, that both of them are not only depicted with deep dark skin, but they also have woolly haired afros as well. And just to reiterate one more time, I understand that, that the icons that were made in the 18th century, 17th century, 16th century, etc. are 
way after the time period that these figures like uh, Constantine and Helena were alive. But please understand that most, most of the original Byzantine art from that time period was destroyed due to an order that was given by a much later Byzantine emperor from Constantine known as Leo III Isurian, who um, we'll talk about more later on in this series. But Leo III basically issued a series of edicts that will go on to become known as Iconoclasm, which basically stated that all religious images that were created to venerate any figure, biblical or historical, had to be destroyed, and anybody who still supported the images would face persecution and, pro and possibly even death. And um, during this time period of iconoclasm, there were a lot of instances where you had people who were known as iconoclasts or image destroyers, um, who wouldn't just destroy a lot of these a lot of these images of figures like Christ, Mary, and um, saints and other notable figures, but they would go but they would actually go as far as to paint over them and quite literally whitewash them. Okay, so so um so called whitewashing is a real thing that's been in existence for a long time, you guys. It's not just a word that was invented by so called Afrocentrists. Um, whitewashing was going on even during back the even back during the medieval time period. And this is why I keep reiterating to you guys that a lot of the icons that you see that depict figures like Constantine and um, that depict him or show him being lighter skinned um, are redone models. Those aren't the real icons that were made from the 18th or 17th century or even before. Um, all of the original icons of that time period and even some of the manuscripts from, the, from in and around the Byzantine era that have still been untouched or um, preserved show the Byzantines as people of color. And we'll see some of those images later on in this video and then even later on in this series. But just getting back to this image right here. Yes, um, this is one of the original Greek icons of Constantine and Helena that once again show them as people of color. So now let's look at another one. Now this one right here is another 18th century icon of Constantine and Helena that shows them clearly as two so-called black people. Okay, and then this is a fresco painting of Constantine and Helena that was made around the 16th century. I believe around 1547 um, through uh, 1551 is around the exact time that it was made. But once again, we can see that they are depicted as so-called black people with dark brown skin. And then here is a and then here's another icon of Constantine and Helena on a wooden panel, clearly depicting them as two black people once again. And then again, just to reiterate the difference between the original icons that were made and the redone ones, here is a more modern icon that um, clearly is, a, is another victim of so-called iconoclasm that once again still definitely goes on to this day as we've seen all throughout this video. But this is pretty obvious right here. I mean, look at this icon and compare it to the original icons that were made act, that were actually made during the 18th century. It's clearly more modernized and it should and it should already be understood that the more modern or modernized images are more often than not the ones that are whitewashed like this one right here. So now here is one of the last icons I will show of Constantine and Helena, um, at least for right now. Um, this was an, this is an 18th century Orthodox icon that depicts both Constantine and his mother Saint Helena, and again it's pretty obvious that these two are so-called black people. You can clearly see the afro that Constantine is adorning in this icon right here, as well as of course the dark brown skin as well. And once again, you can clearly see the difference between original icons that were made of these figures in comparison in comparison to the redone versions like this one right here you can you can tell just by looking at this fake icon that it is far more modernized in overall style and composition than than the than the 18th century icon that I showed previously see here is the 18th century icon that I showed And then here is the fake redone icon that is held at the Patriarchal Cathedral of St. George, who, by the way, um, was a so-called black man too. St. George was. And um, I may show a couple of his icons in this video or sometime in this series as I go forward, but he, he's really um, another story for another day um, because um, his, his narrative occurred during the quote-unquote Imperial Roman Empire's time period. But yeah, again, the concept of whitewashing is indeed a real thing, and a lot of these quote-unquote historical artists still practice painting over certain images or um, creating whole new images of notable historical figures. And like I said, um, this was a practice that went all the way back to the medieval time period. Uh, just as an example, here is an iconoclast from the 9th century literally whitewashing the skin of a portrait that is supposed to depict Christ. Um, as a way to try and bastardize or debase the original image of Christ, which was, which was as a man of color. 
but again i'll talk more about iconoclasm and the whitening of original icon images and even other forms of medieval art and another series i'm going to do um prior to when i go prior to when I get really deep into the medieval time period. But now let's move on and look at a few images of Constantine when he was called into practice, when he called into practice a, re a religious council that really has laid the foundation of most of these so-called Christian practices today, most of it to the detriment of most people who claim to be so-called Christian but have no idea what the practices of the so-called Christian church actually go back to. But let's take a look at some of the images and the icons that depict Constantine at the Council of Nicaea. So this is the first image of Constantine at his famous council, which is a very um, highly regarded and highly revered event that took place even to this day amongst the so-called Christian community because it basically laid the foundation for the basic tenets of quote-unquote Christianity and it even introduced and established a lot of the holidays that Christians celebrate to this day, even down to the day of observation that most so-called Christians adhere to, which of course is known as quote-unquote Sunday. Um, and this, this day was commissioned to be the official day of observation for the Most High in Christ by this Council of Constantine and his 318 bishops that, ha that he had invited from across the entire empire. Um, and they had and they, they had come together at the first municipal council of Nicaea on May 20th, 325 AD. And they did this with the intention to try and combat the teachings of an, e of an Egyptian bishop by the name of Arius, who taught that um, Christ was not fully divine and so that thereby made him inferior to the Most High. And this teaching started to become more and more prominent among um, across the empire amongst Christians, so much so to the point where a lot of the Christian population at the time started to believe that Arius' theory was true, especially since he was such a convincing speaker and provocateur. So Constantine called this um, council to set the record straight about a lot of the disputes Christian teachers such as the bishops were having, including the exact day of quote-unquote Easter, and um, the validity of baptisms by heretics but the main issue of course um, that needed to be addressed and settled was the question of whether or not Christ was equal to the most high or not and long story short um, Constantine officially commissioned that the belief of a quote-unquote trinity was true and that God the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit were all one and the same along with a bevy of other doctrines that aren't really rooted in the scriptures at all whatsoever and again this is something that I will speak about um, and further depth on my biblical channel which you guys should go ahead and subscribe to if you haven't already but just to keep it brief about this particular subject in this video and for the sake of staying on topic for what it's about um, I'll say this for number one like I stated earlier Constantine Constantine just because he was a so-called black man as we can clearly see in this icon right here along with the vast majority of the bishops who participated in the Nicene Council just because they were so-called black does not mean that they are deserving of a high level of praise and adulation from so-called black people. Um, yes, it is rather shocking and awe-inspiring to, to learn that our, people, that our people's history runs this deep, but at the end of the day, figures like Constantine were not righteous in nature, and you can even go as far as to say that Constantine was wicked to a degree, because the, the doctrines that he and the bishops at the Nicene Council produced are the main reasons why so-called Christians partake in and adhere to beliefs and practices that are rooted in the Near Eastern pagan cultures, like the concept of the quote-unquote Trinity, for example. Uh, that concept is never mentioned in the Bible at all whatsoever, and it's premised that the Most High or the Father, Christ or the, Christ or the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all quote-unquote God, but just separated into three different people who are all equally God and are all one and the same. Um, this concept is not scriptural. And the premise of the Most High Christ and the Holy Spirit being all one and the same and equal isn't even true according to the scriptures. Um, those entities are not equal, nor are they the same person. And this is yet again a topic that I will go over on my biblical channel, but you can read verses like 1 Corinthians um, chapter 11 and 3, and then even Matthew chapter the 24th chapter and the 36th verse. And um, just those short singular verses will put into perspective how the concept of the quote-unquote trinity just can't be true or real according to scripture. But again, I will go over this in much greater depth on my biblical channel. But just getting back to the point of this video, because I can go all day to be honest with you about Constantine and his negative impact on the understanding of the scriptures, but I'll just cut it short for right now until I discuss this topic even further. But anyway, once again, this icon right here clearly shows Constantine and the 318 bishops at the Nicene Council as so-called black men. Which, ex which is exactly what they were. And just like the other images of Constantine and his mother Helen, there are fakes and forgeries of these images as well in the form of this image right here. Clearly a more, this is clearly a more modernized, redone image 
um, than the one that I displayed that showed them to be so-called black people. And then here's another one once again, clearly not one of the original icons of the of the Council of Nicaea. And then here is one fake image that I show that I, that shows a heavily whitenized version of the Council of Nicaea. So you guys get the point. This is the real image of Constantine and his Council of Nicaea, or his Council of Bishops at the Council of Nicaea. And the other ones that I showed are nothing more than fabricated forgeries. So now let's take a look at another icon that depicts Constantine at his council. So this is another icon that depicts Constantine at the Nicene Council along with the bishops that participated in it. And again, they are all shown to be people of color. Uh, Constantine can even be seen with an afro-like hairstyle when you look at the image closely. And before I move on to the last image that I, that I want to show, um, I just want to address something that I forgot to mention that could, in a lot of people's eyes, who know even just a little bit about Constantine and his background, um, impact a lot of the claims that I am making about him being a so-called black man, uh, being a so-called black man, and that's that his very father, who was named Constantius the First, um, during his lifetime, was called um, Const Constantius the First Chlorus. And the reason why this could somewhat impact my claims about Constantine being a so-called black man is because the word Chlorus which is an ancient Greek term, meant pale. And so um, most people attribute a pale complexion to, Con to Constantine's father, Constantius. But what people have to understand is that the word chloris has more than one meaning. It doesn't just mean pale. It has a bevy of different meanings like green, light green, yellow, etc. So there could have been a bevy of reasons as to why Constantius I was called chloris. And a very good indicator that he was not called this nickname due to his pale complexion is that one of um, Constantius's private secretaries named uh, Eumenius stated that he had a quote-unquote sanguine complexion. Now the word sanguine basically means like a dark red color. Um, some people may refer to it as a quote-unquote blood red color and it's basically just a reddish brown color or brown with a reddish undertone to, to it. So in other words, Constantius was referred to as a man with a more reddish brown complexion than a strict pale complexion, which is the presumed translation of that nickname for, Con for Constantius, even though there is no real evidence for that being the reason why he was called Chloris. Um, and there are even some historians who attribute the nickname of Chloris for Constantius due to him wearing green royal garments, um, which would make sense because, again, one of the definitions for Chloris is green or pale green. So, again, Constantius was most likely not called Chloris because he was pale in complexion. And as we've seen thus far, his son Constantine definitely was not originally depicted as a man of quote-unquote pale complexion. Constantine was actually described in a similar way to his father, though, um, only um, the word that was used to describe to him um, by a 10th century um, Byzantine historian named Cedrinus was quote-unquote ruddy, which to us today means like a pale reddish color, but when you look back at the etymological origin of the term ruddy um, and Latin terms that derive from ruddy, such as ruset or rubidus and even rubicundus, um, those words meant the same as sand wind, basically. They um, basically all meant being of a dark red or reddish brown color or reddish brown complexion. But I'll expand on what the term ruddy meant as, as opposed to what it means today all throughout this medieval series that I've started. But, but yeah, uh, Constantine and his father were described as men of color. And as we've seen, Constantine was even depicted in the original icons that were made of him as a man of color as well. But now let's look at one more icon of Constantine and then we'll move on. So here is the last icon I wanted to show that depicts Constantine, who is um, shown in the bottom left corner with the red robe on next to the big wooden cross that the woman um, to the left is holding. Um, I believe that is um, his mother, Helena. Um, but again, but again, um, yeah, I mean, it's very obvious that once again, when we look at this image, Constantine was originally depicted as a so-called black man. And this was um, painted to, to by an Albanian artist named um Athanasios of Corse in 776. So again, when a lot of these icons were originally made, the artists that created them depicted the quote-unquote saints or prominent figures that had a large impact on the quote-unquote Christian religion, along with um, divinity figures like the Most High, Christ, the angels, etc. as so-called black. Um, this can be seen all throughout just this image right here. All of the saints and bishops are depicted as so-called black people. And even the quote-unquote divine figures on the top, whether they be the apostles or the angels on either side of the top right and left corners, and even the mother Mary and Christ, they're all depicted as so-called black. And um, the, the image of Mary and Christ as being so-called black is something that can be seen widespread all throughout Catholic and Orthodox art, whether it be in statues or paintings. Um, and this concept is something that is known as the quote-unquote black Madonna, 
which like all things that are associated with the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church or just the quote unquote Christian Church in general, it has its origins rooted in paganism. But once again, that is something that I will talk about on my biblical channel pertaining to the origins of the so-called Christian Church. But anyway, once again, this is another icon that was made that depicts Constantine as a so-called black man. So it can be so it, so it should be obvious that Constantine was indeed a black man. And I already state, and as I already stated, um, this earlier pertaining to the icons and them being not necessarily an eyewitness representation of what Constantine looked like, um, since they were made way after Constantine lived. Um, but the understanding that most of these artists had about Constantine and his appearance has to have been that he was indeed a so-called black man. And even though we don't have any resources to go off of in regards to what Constantine actually looked like, since most of the Byzantine art was destroyed during the age of iconoclasm, which is something that um, we'll talk about in much greater detail later on in this series. Um, but when we look at some of the some of the only remaining unchanged images of Constantine, like this silver medallion right here that was minted in 315 A.D., which was around the time Constantine was alive, um, and well into his um, period time period as emperor of both the Eastern Eastern and Western Roman empires, um, it shows the front view or the front um, the front perspective of Constantine's face, and this medallion clearly depicts him with a flat nose and thick lips, showing him clearly as a so-called black man. So once again, it should be clear that according to the original later icons of Constantine and even his mother Helena, that they were people of color or so-called black people. And so with this understanding, as we look down the line and his successors, such as his son Constantius II, and um, how he was described, he was said to be a person of color just like his father as well. So let's just take a look at how the son of Constantine, who, be, who became his first successor and the second emperor of the Byzantine Empire, looked like. So this is a description of the successor and son of Constantine the Great, um, named after his grandfather Constantius I or Constantius Chlorus, um, i.e. the Pale. But of course we've already went over why he was truly called that and it didn't have to do with him being pale skinned or anything like that. But anyway, let's read what this description of Constantius II says um, about how he appeared or how he looked. So swarthy with watchful bulging eyes, he had soft hair and close shaven cheeks that were clean and smooth. He was peculiarly long of body but very short in leg, enabling him to excel at running and jumping. Okay, and this was a quote uh, that was made by a man who was actually an officer in the army of Constantius II and his cousin who was named Julian and then he was also nicknamed the apostate due to him trying to reinvigorate the predominant pagan religious system in ancient Rome before it was heavily Christianized by Constantine. But anyway, as we can see here from the jump, Constantius II was described as being swarthy. Now we've gone over this term swarthy on this channel before. Um, it's been a while since I've mentioned it, but just for the sake of this description that was given of Constantius II, and to put it into its proper context, I'll explain once more what this term swarthy meant. Not what it means right now, but what it meant back during the ancient world to antiquity, to even the medieval time period, etc. So, but the term swarthy back then, or back during this time, was basically used in the same way that someone would use the, the term black today. When you look up the etymological origin of the word swarthy or and or swart or swarty and their various other forms, you'll clearly see that those words just simply meant someone who was so-called black. One example of this is a character that was created in and around the late 19th century by the name of Zwarty, uh, Zwarty Payet. And some of you who are watching this video may already have heard of, heard of this character before, but for, the, for those of you who don't know um, who or what this figure is, Zwarty Payet or Black Peter is a 19th century Dutch character that was said to be a quote unquote companion of St. Nicholas. Who would um who we who we would call today um Santa Claus quote unquote Santa Claus and by the way the person who uh Saint Nicholas or quote unquote Santa Claus was based on was also a so-called black man by the name of Saint Nicholas of Myra and he was a um, bishop of Greek descent that existed in and around the time period of Constantine and Constantius II but I'll probably talk about um Saint Nicholas later on more in this series. Um, but just getting back to Zwarte Payet, again, he was a companion of St. Nicholas's, and he was also depicted as a so-called black man. And one of the main indicators of this was his name, quote-unquote, Zwarte, and then Payet. Okay, the word Zwarte is basically just an alternate form of the word Swarthy, or Swart. And all the words Zwart or Zwarte meant in the old Phrygian 
or Dutch language was a so-called black person. Okay, and the correlation between Zwarte and Swarthy or Swart can be seen when we look at the basic definition of the word Zwart and its etymological origin. So, so now let's just take a look at a few examples of this, of this just to prove what I'm, that what I'm saying is correct. So first we're going to look at etymolo etymology.com's definition of the word Swarthy. So now let's read this real quick. So dark colored, tawny, especially in reference to skin, 1580s, an unexplained alteration of Swarty. 1570s from Swartz and then plus uh, the Y. So this definition basically just tells us what the word swarthy is, um, or that the word swarthy is basically just an alteration of the word Swartz or Swarty. So now let's just take a look at what the word Swart means. So now this is the entry for Swart. And as we can see from the first sentence, the term swart comes from an old English word um, that was called Swartz, or that was um, Swartz, which means black or being of a dark hue. So thereby the word swart means black, right? And then, and, then, and then when we go down to where it gives the Dutch translation of the word, it says Dutch zwart. Okay, so in the Dutch, which is where the, which is where the character zwarte or zwart payet comes from, the equivalent of the word swart is, is zwart. And as we just saw, the word swart, which is where swarthy comes from, means black. And as in reference to um, a person's skin color, right? So again, for everybody that says swarthy doesn't mean black or a so-called black person, uh, that may be true for the modern day definition of the word swarthy, but back then, the word swarthy or swart just meant a so-called black person. Just like the word swart or zwarte means a black person as well, as is evidenced by the character zwarte Pyatt or black Peter. Again, zwart, swart, swarthy, all just meant black. Okay, and then here's another example of the words Zwarte or Zwart um, and how they relate to Swart, which was the precursor of the word Swarthy. And it says Zwart, Dutch, from Old Dutch, Swart. So again, Zwart comes from, comes from Swart. And when we scroll down to what it means as an adjective, it says that it means, uh, for number one, black, and then number two, having dark skin, just like Zwarte or Swarthy. Um, Pyatt had dark or black skin himself. And just going to one last example from Ancestry.com's definition of the word Zwart, it states Dutch, also de Zwart, nickname for someone with black hair or dark complexion. From Dutch Zwart, black, swarthy. Okay, so right here, black and swarthy are used interchangeably with one another because once again, Zwart, which means black, is the same as Swart or swarthy, which also, as we've seen, meant black. Okay, so just going back to Constantius II and how he was described as being swarthy by an eyewitness account of what he looked like um, that was given by one of his army officers um, who was named, I believe his name was Am 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 Amianus Marcellinus. Yeah, but he was described as swarthy. Constantius II was described as swarthy. And now that we know what the term swarthy meant as opposed to what it means right now, which is just a person with a slight tan, but now that we know what it originally meant, we can now pinpoint why Constantius II was called Swarthy. It was because, like we saw with his father, um, Constantine the Great, he was also a man of color or a so-called black man. And so now that we know that, um, let's move forward a little bit and look at some of the later emperors within the Byzantine Empire that would carry on the over 1,000 year legacy of this great medieval kingdom. So now let's just take a look at a few of the emperors that succeeded Constantine and his son Constantius II. And of course, um, I'm not going to be going over the whole laundry list of rulers and emperors that presided over the Byzantine Empire because that would just make um, the series way too extensive. So we're just going to take a look at some descriptions, um, depictions, and portrayals of what certain emperors from the Byzantine Empire looked like. So now let's look at the Byzantine Emperor Valens who ruled from about 360, 364 to 378 AD, and he succeeded his brother Valentinian I and was most known for his interactions with the Germanic Visigothic tribes during the late 4th century AD. And um, he was able to cross the um, Danube in, or the Danube River in Germany in 367 AD, and he was able to completely devastate the Visigothic territories. And then two years later, in 369 AD, he was able to completely defeat the Visigothic tribes that he that he um, did battle against. But later on, the Visigoths um, would appear before Valens again, but this time it, they were in a more supplicant state of being due to them being thoroughly defeated by the by the Huns. Who, by the way, they were so-called black people as well. The Huns, those were so-called black people. Um, well, at least a certain segment of them 
were so-called black, particularly the the Hunnic tribes that was led by Attila the Hun, who himself was described as a so-called black man. But that will be another, that will be another story for another day when I talk about the Huns um, in an even more extensive sense. But anyway, the Visigoths were allowed by Valens' generals to stay in the Roman territory near the south of the Danube region in Germany. But later on, the Visigoths um, rebelled against Valens and the, Roman and the Roman Empire and waged a war that will become known as the Battle of Adrianople on August the 9th, 378 AD. And it resulted in Valens' defeat and eventual death. So, but um, now that I've gone over a little bit about Valens, let's take a look at how um, he was described. So now this is the description that was given about Valens by the same man who I cited the description of Constantius II from. Um, Amianus Marcellinus, who lived during the reigns of Valens and his brother Valentinian I, and then also the son of Valentinian I, who was named Gratian. So now let's read what um, this eyewitness account of what Emperor Valens looked like um, says. So now let's take a look at how he was described. So he was dilatory and sluggish of a swarthy complexion, had a cast in one eye a and a blemish, however, which was not visible at a distance. Okay, and I'll just stop there. But as we can see, Valens was described as having a swarthy complexion. And as I've already went over, what, the, what that term swarthy meant, when I talked about Constantius II, um, there is no need to bring that back. So there's no, no need to bring that back up again. But once again, as we can see, Valens was indeed described as being swarthy or a person of color or a so-called black man. So now let's take a look at another example of what another Byzantine emperor looked like who was described as being quote-unquote swarthy. To put into further context what I've stated um, the term swarthy meant etymologically prior to the altering of that word to mean someone who has a slight tan color to their skin. And the emperor we're going to take a look at to prove, to prove this comes from the dynasty that ruled over the Byzantine Empire subsequent to the dynasty that Valens was a part of, which was known as the Theodosian dynasty, the dynasty that succeeded Valens' dynasty. Um, and that spanned from about 370 to 457 AD. And the emperor we're going to talk about, um, or the emperor that we're going to take a look at is um, Arcadius. So now let's talk a little bit about him. So the reign of the Emperor Arcadius marked the very first time that both the Eastern and Western Roman, Empire, Roman halves of the empires were split up into two separate kingdoms. Um, before the kingdoms were split and functioned as their own autonomous entity, one emperor would usually have seniority over the other one, which led to them having more influence in both kingdoms instead of just their own. But the, com but the complete split that occurred during the reigns of Arcadius and his brother Hon Honorus marked the first time that the western and eastern halves of the Roman empires were, were their own separate kingdoms. And Arcadius um, being the emperor of the east, which was the side of the Roman Empire that over the years has been classified as the quote-unquote Byzantine side, um, basically made Arcadius the first official autonomous quote-unquote Byzantine ruler. B but besides this, Arcadius's rule was a relatively ineffective one due to him being dominated and manipulated by his minister, who was also what was known as a quote-unquote prefect. Um, the, um, and a prefect was basically, was basically just someone who was a high official within the Roman Empire, and this prefect was named uh, Rufinus. And Rufinus was basically from the start um, trying to usurp Arcadius as the emperor of the eastern half of the Roman Empire by first trying to tie himself to Arcadius through um, attempting to make Arcadius feel compelled to marry his daughter, which didn't work since Arcadius ended up marrying, marrying another woman by the name of Aella um, Eudoxia. Um, but Rufinus had eventually assumed control over the eastern half of the Roman Empire and had a budding rivalry with, rivalry with another pseudo-emperor in the, in the western half of the Roman Empire named um, Stil Stilicho, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but um, Stilicho was a Roman military commander of German, Germanic Vandal origins that served under the father of both Arcadius and Honorus, um, Theodosius I. And after, and after Theodosius I's death, he acted as the caretaker of Honorus and was able to basically be able, basically be able to be the de facto emperor of the West due to Honorus um, or Honorius being too young to preside over the um, empire on its own. So, but Rufinus was eventually killed by his own men at, at Constantinople in November of 395 AD, and this ended Rufinus's reign over Arcadius. But soon after, there would be others that manip that manipulated Arcadius, such as such as other ministers of his, like um, Eutropius, and then even his own wife Eudoxia, who manipulated and dominated Arcadi Arcadius as well. 
um, his wife Eudoxia even had influence over Arcadius in his banishment of a very important figure in the early church at the time by the name of John Christendom, which further helped to push the success of Eudoxia's policies that were based in the belief of the Egyptian bis bishop Arius, who we discussed earlier, um, pertaining to the reasoning for the first municipal council of, of Nicaea having to be called, but... Um, yeah, in a nutshell, Arcadius' reign is basically remembered by his ineptitude and weakness overall as a ruler. But the reason why he is important to go over um, right now is because he was another Byzantine empire who was described emperor who was described as being um, quote unquote swarthy, like Constantius II and Valens. But unlike them, there was an actual there was an actual accurate depiction of him that will give us a glimpse at what these swarthy emperors most likely looked like during their lifetime. Um, but before we take a look at that, let's just see that let's just see and confirm that Arcadius was indeed referred to as swarthy. So now let's just read this entry real quick to see that Arcadius was indeed described as being quote unquote swarthy. So now we're going to start here where it says possibly so. Possibly um Philostorgius did too. And by the way, Philostorgius was a church historian that lived during the late fourth and and um, early 5th centuries AD but anyway but he gives what is undoubtedly an eyewitness description of the short swarthy lethargic Arcadius standing by the tall handsome alert Rufinus okay so we see here that this entry states that Arcadius was described by an eyewitness account as being a man with a swarthy complexion i.e. he was a man of color or a black man but to back this up, let's take a look at an old Byzantine manuscript that accurately depicts not only what Arcadius looked like, but also what his father Theodosius I and his brother Honorius looked like. So now this image comes from a manuscript known as the Manassas Chronicle, which was a Byzantine manuscript that was created by a 12th century Byzantine chronicler by the name of Constantine Manassas. So this image derives from someone who may, who may, um, who may not have been an eyewitness account of what Arcadius looked like but he most likely read the descriptions of Arcadius like the one that we just read that had an actual eyewitness account um, in it from Phil from Philo Storg Storgius um, and what he had to say about Arcadius describing him as a swar as a man of quote unquote swarthy complexion right so right here we can see that we can see what was implied by the term swarthy and what it meant pertaining to Arcadius because in this image we can see here that Arcadius along with the other two central figures that are standing by each other um, who are also Arcadius's brother Honorus and their father Theodosius and I'm not quite sure which one is which in this image but either way they are all depicted as people of very dark brownish skin complexion um, like that of a so-called black person or so-called black people but um, there's this narrative that exists about um, the alleged translations that um, about the alleged translations of what guys like um, Theodosius the first looked like that stated that allegedly Theodosius the first had blonde hair and fair skin which is very strange because even when you look at even when you look up descriptions of his other son Honorius he is also regarded as being a man of dark complexion and of course as we've already seen in this in the manuscript that depicted him he certainly was someone who had a dark skin complexion so neither of his sons had the same physical traits that their father was allegedly said to have um, but there have been even um, facial reconstructions made of these figures, um, especially of Arcadius, um, that have been made to try and recreate the face of Arcadius, making him look like this. Now, this is very reminiscent of the facial reconstructions that I showed in my video series about the ancient Egyptians, where figures like Ramses II, King Tut, Thutmose IV, and um, Akhenaten and Nefertiti, and a bevy of others were portrayed as um, either Caucasian-looking or quote-unquote Oriental-looking. But just like with those historical figures, figures like Theodosius, Arcadius, and Honoris um, were all men of color or so-called black men. Just as this manuscript image that was made by an actual Byzantine chronicler portrays them to be. And we've already seen how an eyewitness account of Arcadius um, described him as looking like, as being, a man, as being a man of swarthy complexion, right? I.e. he was a man of color, or at least um, a man of some, some sort of color. But when we look at this facial reconstruction again, I mean, this person right here is paler than a piece of paper. I mean, like, look at this. Now, um, this is not how Arcadius was described, and this is not how he was betrayed by an actual Byzantine source or actual Byzantine sources. So this depiction cannot be accurate. And again, just like in the ancient Egyptian series, we are going to see a lot of inconsistencies in how these emperors were described and portrayed during their lifetime, as opposed to how they are depicted in the mainstream. 
Okay, we've already seen we've already seen it to a degree with Constantine, and now we're seeing it with Arcadius, along with his family members and fellow Byzantine emperors Honorius and Theodosius the First. So before I end this video, I will just give one more last bonus description of a Byzantine emperor from the dynasty that succeeded Arcadius's dynasty. And um, this dynasty was known as the Leonid dynasty, and one of the most prominent emperors that sprang forth from this dynasty was an emperor by the name of Zeno. So let's take a look at um, how Zeno was described real quick, and then we'll wrap this first installment in this series up. So now this description comes from a scribe by the name of Leo Grammaticus. So now let's read how he described the emperor Zeno. So Zeno was like the Greek's description of Pan, hairy-legged, goat-like, with wild hair, black of skin, and ridiculous in physique. So as we can see, the Emperor Zeno was described as being black of skin. So once again, he's yet another Byzantine emperor that was, that was documented as being a so-called black man. But that will conclude this video, which is just the tip of the iceberg for what, for, for what we're going to see moving forward. Not only in this series, but in later series as I have coming down the pike pertaining to the medieval time period. Um, like I've told you guys before, this series is really supposed to is really supposed to set the stage for, in my opinion, one of the most important time periods in so-called black people's history that needs to be explained with a far greater degree of intricacy and detail than what has been taught to us. So this series on the Byzantine Empire, which, which was established right before, like literally um, a little over a century before they started the medieval time period and the collapse of the Imperial Roman time period in 476 AD, which by the way, um, this time period in history, the beginning of the medieval times was also, was also essential because it marked the official end of the rulership of the so-called Caucasian when he ruled over most of the Imperial Roman Empire. Now, towards the latter half of the Imperial Roman Empire, um, so-called black people started to creep into the upper class and eventually they were able to overtake it and become Roman emperors themselves. Guys like, of course, the most notable ones that everybody knows about already, the North African Septimius Severus and his sons, Gita and, Cal and Caracalla, um, down to Marcrinus the Moor. Those were all so-called black men. But even guys like Trajan, Hadrian, Marcus Aurelius, and his son, Commodus, those were so-called black men as well. Um, pretty much all of the quote-unquote five good emperors during the Pax Romagna or Golden Age of Rome were so-called black and they were of um, Iberian or Spaniard stock, but that will be something for another day. But, but yeah, we're going to discover a lot about the quote-unquote Dark Ages as we move forward with these various series that are coming on that are, that are coming down the line, and we'll continue this series in the next video.